Well, hello, Nativity Bible Heads. It is Dr. Wayne, and it is time for Sunday Morning Power Bible Study. We are in uh, 1 Kings chapter 2 for a few verses, and then into chapter, th chapter 3, and then uh, Psalm 111, um, Ephesians 5, 15 to 20, and then um, we continue in that bread of life uh, discourse of Jesus in John. Uh, John chapter 6, verses 51 to 58. So um, let's get right to it. Um, in our first Kings narrative, we have been noticing that um, David, uh, David's kingship has been emphasized. And our first verses tell us, oh, we're moving on from David finally. Yes, we are. Uh, here we are in 1 Kings uh, chapter 2, verses 10 through 12. 10 through 12. David... Then David slept with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David. That's what Jerusalem was called at the time. Um, to sleep with the ancestors is a euphemism. We all know what that means. Yes, he died. Uh -huh. The time that David reigned over Israel was 40 years. He reigned seven years in Hebron and 33 years in Jerusalem. So Solomon sat on the throne of his father David and his kingdom was firmly established. Remember, there was a big promise that was made to David that his line would continue forever, right? So, um, uh, and one of the big things that David did was to uh, capture Jerusalem and make it uh, the capital of, the, uh, of, of his kingdom. And he unified worship, uh, in, centralized worship in Jerusalem. Um, that's going to become... A, a sticking point later on because there tends to be worship elsewhere and uh, the Deuteronomistic historian that is narrating this uh, doesn't like that very much um, but I want to read something that David says to Solomon before he dies and it's back in um, uh, chapter 2 verse 1 where he says when David's time to draw to die drew near he charged his son Solomon saying I am about to go the way of all the earth. Be strong, be courageous, and keep the charge of the Lord your God, walking in his ways and keeping his statutes, his commandments, his ordinances, and his testimonies as it is written in the law of Moses so that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. Then the Lord will establish his word that he spoke concerning me if your heirs take heed to their way to walk before me in faithfulness with all their heart and with all their soul, there shall not fail you a successor on the throne of Israel. Moreover, okay, well, um, the, fact, the bottom line is this. Our narrator puts the Deuteronomistic historian theology into David's speaking. And so um, that was his speaking to his son Solomon, who would be taking over the throne. So... Let us move on to chapter 3, verses 3 to 14, where we see that, uh, and, and we get on with Solomon. Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statute of his father David. Why doesn't it say he walked in the statutes of, Mo statutes of Moses? Because that seems to be the emphasis, but anyway. Uh, the statutes of his father David. Only he sacrificed and offered incense at the high places. The, the narrator doesn't like this. Uh, any kind of Yahwist worship that is done outside of Jerusalem is considered to be a violation of the law, of the law of Moses, of the teaching that, were, that they were given. And, um, but he gets, he gets a bit of a pass here. Notice verse 4. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the principal high place. High places were uh, raised platforms that were used for uh, open air worship outside of Jerusalem. Um, uh, they, be, they came to be uh, seen as um, uh, um, evil, uh, what is the word? <laughs> Uh, the word is escaping me. A pagan. Uh, they were not allowed um, uh, later on. But uh, notice our narrator gives Solomon a pass on this. For the principal high place, Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, 
ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, you have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness in, of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. Wow. So um, it looks like God's trying to write him a blank check, even though he's already got the guarantee of the continued uh, rule, reign, right? Um, verse seven, and now, O Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, although I am only a little child. This is uh, the way we express ourselves when we're um, putting ourselves down in front of a superior. Oh, I'm only, a, but I'm but a boy, but I'm but a child. This is typical. I do not know how to go out or come in, what, that doesn't mean he doesn't know when to come in out of the rain. What it means is he has no military experience. This is a militaristic term, um, not knowing how to go out and come in. He hasn't, led, he hasn't been a military figure. He's not that kind of guy. David was, okay, big time. David was a big time military guy, uh, led a lot of um, war type stuff. This wasn't Solomon's bag, okay? And your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous that they cannot be numbered or counted. This is um, a, uh, a hyperbole uh, regarding the nature of how many, the, of their number. Um, this is a big part of the Deuteronomistic historian, the idea that the promise of Abraham that um, that his descendants couldn't be numbered because they would be like the sands, you know. Um, so this is a this is a common thing that we see in Scripture, uh, speaking in in this hyperbolized way about their numbers. This is also probably one of the reasons why um, uh, taking a census was considered so evil. Did you uh, remember that when David got in trouble for doing a census and there, um, it's like the census was always considered evil. Um, maybe it's because um, the theory was that, oh, well, if they're so great and numerous that they cannot be numbered or counted, how dare we try to count them? Hmm. All right, verse nine. Give it your servant therefore. Ah, this is where he's saying he finally gets to the ask. The ask, give your servant therefore an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil for who can govern this, your great people? Nobody can do this, but only, I just want, I just want to be able to understand. It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this God said to him, because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself, your uh, understanding to discern what is right, I now do according to your word. Mm -hmm. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you and no one like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor all your life. No other king shall compare with you. If you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your life. And that ends the dream. So, as we can see, okay, Solomon was one of the best kings, okay? This tradition about him, uh, th this uh, portion of kings uh, concentrates on all the good that he does and all of the opulence that he maintains and all of the power that he uh, uh, accumulates. But in the end, he ends up being not so great of a king because the kingdom divides at the end. Remember, David had done this wonderful job of uh, uniting the kingdom, which had not been under Saul. Um, and, uh, and it was a tenuous kind of a connection. Well, 
Solomon doesn't hold it together. It ends up splitting when he's done. So even though there's this tradition on this, the, the good, there's the good side of the kings and the bad side of the kings. And this one side of the king of Solomon is, uh, emphasizes how, how unselfish he was in his request of God. And it's like, you are so, he's, he's being so unselfish, so unselfish that he's actually going to get what he didn't ask, okay? Try it, eh, yeah. Um, uh, we know that you can have wisdom and not necessarily make good judgments everywhere. That doesn't necessarily mean you're a good king. That doesn't necessarily mean you can hold a country together. Um, just because you ha are smart, um, that doesn't seem to, doesn't seem to uh, matter in the long run. What matters is the grace of God, and the grace of God uh, is something that we can't earn. It's something that we can't deserve. It's not, there's nothing for us to do to get that. This is the nature of grace. This is what the New Testament, where it goes in that direction. We gotta remember something here. This promise to David and his posterity of always being, a, a, his line being on the throne, it wasn't a prize. It wasn't something that was given them because oh, there was something wonderful that he did. No, that wasn't anything like that. It was all just God saying, I'm just gonna do this because I can do this. That's it. So it's an example of grace. So Solomon, uh, in living into that reality, uh, makes the right choice, and he asks God for this kind of understanding, this discernment, and then we get examples of it, examples of it, and we need to keep in mind that all of the warnings that Samuel made with regard to the problems of having a king that would arise, all of it, all of the bad stuff arose during Solomon's reign. So just because Solomon uh, was magnanimous in making this request didn't make him the perfect king forever and ever. It just represents a good moment in how we are supposed to treat the grace that God gives us, okay? How do we use the grace that God gives us? Do we use it for, uh, in our, to, to, to make our, to build ourselves even more up or do we use it uh, in, in a magnanimous way for God? Um, uh, apparently, uh, Solomon uh, made some good decisions, but in the end, uh, he couldn't hold, he couldn't hold the, the power uh, in, in the right way. He doesn't, he doesn't even ask to be a good king. He just asks to be able to make good discernment. This is the, where we get the wisdom tradition. Okay, the, the tradition of the wisdom of Solomon being the greatest, like nobody's been wiser than Solomon, that's one of the reasons why the, the, the uh, tradition arose that all of the wisdom writings uh, that we have in the Bible, Proverbs, uh, uh, um, Proverbs, um, um, Job, <laughs> and the like, are written by Solomon. No, not necessarily. Okay, all right. So um, our psalm today is goes along with uh, this because what we're keying in on is the request for wisdom and the exercise of wisdom, okay? Uh, psalm 111, if we turn to Psalm 111, um, it's one of these, uh, it's a 22-line uh, psalm that is an acrostic in the Hebrew language. What is an acrostic? It's the, when you, if you were to take your ABCs and you start, you write a letter of the alphabet up and, up, up and down vertically, um, and you write a sentence, each one beginning with that letter of the alphabet. That's what it is. Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalet, Hey, Vav, Zion, He, Chet, Tet, Zion. Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalet, Hey, Vav, Zion, Chet, Tet, Yod, Kaf, Laman, Mem, Nun, Samak, Ayin, Peit, Zadeh, Kofre, Sin, Shin, Tav. Those are the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Now, um, uh, and, it, and that's the way it reads. Hallelujah! I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright, 
in the congregation. Great are the deeds of the Lord. They are studied by all who delight in them. His work is full of majesty and splendor, and his righteousness endures forever. He makes his marvelous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. So it basically just starts out as a, a, a psalm of praise. And when you are limited by using the letters of your alphabet, you can't really develop much of a theme. You, or you can't really progress much. You just basically can go for like saying kind of the same thing a lot and again and over again. Well, that's kind of what we have here. <clears throat> Verse four, he makes his marvelous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He gives food to those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. So the food to those who fear him, that refers to the wilderness tradition with the manna and the giving of the bread from heaven. Oh, that, stay tuned for the Jesus reading later. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the nation, the lands of the nations. So here they're referring to the gift of the promised land, yes. The works of his hand, verse seven, are faithfulness and justice. All his commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever because they are done in truth and equity. He sent redemption to his people. He commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord, ah, here it is, is the beginning of wisdom. Those who act accordingly have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. That's what we're getting at. That's what the whole thing is about. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And that's what Solomon asked for. Now, this fear of the Lord being the beginning of wisdom. We're going to see this theme continue in our Ephesians reading because, well, you'll see it here. Uh, chapter 5 of Ephesians, verses 15 to 20. It's only six verses. Be careful how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise. Well, there you go. See that wisdom theme? Making the most of the time because... The days are evil. This is a reference to the fact that it was seen that um, the time uh, was pregnant with possibility, okay? The days are evil. Um, it's not saying that there's anything wrong with nighttime. It's just, it's just, that, uh, it's just that thing of, uh, of um, uh, being um, opportunity opportunity okay for the days are evil so do not be foolish but understand what the will of the Lord is again this takes wisdom yes do not get drunk with wine for that is debauchery but be filled with the spirit he contrasts the experience of drunkenness with the experience of worship um, worship apparently is supposed to create that same kind of effect that uh, one would get with the spirits. Um, interesting because our emphasis in our in our worship is not so much that, is it? Um, it's much more of a staid and steady kind of a thing. Um, um, Paul seems to think that um, it should be akin to the um, the the kind of uh, the kind of uh, feeling that we get when we are a bit um, inebriated, shall we say. Um, I don't know if that means we need to reevaluate our worship, possibly. I don't know. Um, but um, it is an interesting uh, contrast, is it not? But be filled with the Spirit. As you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I tell you what, if you can give thanks to God at all times for everything, woo wee now that's wisdom. Um, uh, uh, I can remember reading a book about that a uh, long, 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 long time ago back, oh gosh, maybe I was even in high school. Um, but um, the idea of uh, what is it like to live life giving thanks for everything? Um, 
Wisdom is uh, the ability to give thanks for everything. And that's not the same thing as saying that, um, oh, everything happens for a reason. No, that's not the same thing. What this is, 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 is living life in such a way that you know how God is dealing with you. And how the way God deals with you might not be the way God deals with somebody else. You might learn something from something in your life different than what somebody else might learn. So we, you can never say what that is for another person, but you know what? You can say that for yourself. That's what wisdom is. If you can then look at those things and give thanks at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's, that's rough. That's a rough thing to do, especially if you've had horrible things happen to you in your life. Wisdom will actually able, be able to get through that to the point of being thankful. Can you imagine such a thing? It's hard to, it's hard to imagine such a thing, but I believe that that is what um, Paul uh, says here. Um, let's move on. We are moving on. We are moving on to uh, John chapter 6, verses 51 to 58. Now, we've been in uh, this bread of life chapter, John chapter 6. Uh, this is now three or four Sundays. I, I have lost track, quite frankly. I think it might be three um, with two more. Who knows? Uh, yeah, it gets kind of redundant. Um, the little the booklets that people can pick up to uh, get ideas for teaching and preaching from this it basically says, well, God love you if you've tried to teach on this every week and find something new to say. <laughs> Let's look at this in John chapter 6, verses 51 to 58. The Jews, well, no, um, no, 51. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread of, that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Here's one of the things we got to keep in mind when um, Jesus is speaking here about himself as being the bread of life. Remember in this gospel, John's gospel, the, we don't have a narration of the Passover meal. We have the instance where the Passover meal happened, you know, what we commonly call the Last Supper, but we don't have it narrated. What we get instead is what happens after it with the foot washing. In the Gospel of John, Jesus is the Passover meal. So if Jesus is the Passover meal, then guess what? Why would you narrate a Passover meal? Right? So this is what this is all a riff on. Now, um, he had uh, what began all of this was Jesus feeding uh, the people, and then there was that walking on water thing, and now he keeps talking about himself as being bread from heaven. Remember that thing we saw back in the Psalms uh, about um, he gave them bread from heaven, um, the manna. Jesus is equating himself with that gift of God, that free gift of God to God's people uh, when God's people need it most, or to the world. I mean, in the wilderness, it was just uh, that, that localized community. But now Jesus, it's like, it's a bigger game. It's for, that, for the world. He's the bread for the world, okay? Verse 52. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat. Jesus, so Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. A lot of scholars think that what's going on here is a presumption of the Eucharistic meal. Very possibly. Um, I don't have a whole lot to contribute to it, but I just want you to get that that's a valid uh, viewpoint, that what we have here is a uh, uh, Jesus speaking uh, like of the Eucharist, like, the, like we practice the Eucharist even today. Those who eat my flesh 
and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. He's said this before about raising people up on the last day. It had to do with people um, back in... Um, Back in verse 44 says, no one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me and I will raise that person up on the last day. Um, there is a very um, apocalyptic element to the Christ that we see in the Gospel of John because remember what he's trying to do all along is to tell people who he is and um, have people get who he is and they don't get it for the most part. They don't get it, they don't get it, they don't get it. Um, that's the reason why he has to continue to seemingly say the same thing again and again. Verse 55, for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. True, okay, true drink, true food, true drink, as opposed to anything that would have you hunger or thirst again. He's already said that, has he not? Yes, he has. Verse 56, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. To abide means to stay, to remain, to not leave. This is one of the reasons why, the, in the, especially in the Catholic tradition, there's this, there's this of, uh, you know, doing the, the daily mass even. That was a thing, uh, a big, big thing of taking the mass every day. Why? Because of this is what he said, you know, well, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them, well then therefore what are we gonna do? We're gonna do the communion more, as often as we can, right? Seems logical, right? Just, verse 57, just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This idea of the living father, um, uh, this is a play on words because of his life. The idea here is, well, you know, well, it's not there, there's no God is dead thing here, here going on here. But um, the idea is that uh, he's contrasted the people who have um, eaten the manna, they're dead. Um, but the Father lives, the Father, the abiding, so it's the same God, okay? That's the idea. It's the same God that gave them food in the wilderness. Um, that's the same one. This is, there's, there's not a new one. This is the living Father, okay? And I live because of the Father, okay? So whoever eats me will live because of me. Yeah. Um, Jesus seems to say the same thing in circles, does he not? Verse 58, this is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate, and they died. He said this before, he's saying it again. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. Again, this is one of the reasons why people think this is strongly influenced by a liturgy of the Eucharist that had developed in the early church and now we have Jesus teaching it in John as a way of backing up the way the tradition had been going on. So um, a, lot of, a lot of scholars feel that this is uh, a speaking from the existence of the Eucharistic theology um, that was being practiced with the Eucharist of the earliest church in a way of teaching people exactly why they need to do that. That's reason, one of the reasons why we believe that um, this practice that we do in the church of the, the Eucharist with the wine and the host um, is uh, from, we didn't make this up. This wasn't something that came in the medieval days. This is something from the earliest, earliest, earliest time. And it all extends from the fact that Jesus himself was the Passover meal. Yes, the gospels, uh, the synoptics uh, tell us about um, Jesus uh, 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 observing the Passover. John, in John, Jesus is the Passover. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. 
Um, there's, that's okay. That's uh, I just read an extra verse there, but it's going to go on for another couple of weeks in that bread of life passage. But um, if you look at it, the point uh, carries through, though, does it not? From the wisdom of Solomon um, to the wisdom of of the of the, that Paul was admonishing the early Christians to 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 uh, have with regard to the ways of the world to now uh, Jesus uh, being, you know, the, so eat me, I am that food, I am that wisdom, I am that word, okay? Um, it seems to follow uh, uh, that theme, I believe, of that, the, what is the true wisdom to the point of eating it. There's a, there's a, there's a, uh, a sanctity to uh, uh, food consumption in scripture that, it's not so much, it's kind of lost on us today. We're not as, uh, we're not as uh, uh, conscious of it because um, we see, oh, goodness, we have food competition, food eating competitions. You've seen that, right? Where people down a whole lot of food. Uh, food has kind of lost that connection for us, uh, even as just a sustaining thing. But back then, uh, food was a way, it was communion. It was literal, it was, it was intercourse, okay? It was a social intercourse and you couldn't be enemies with anybody you ate with. To eat with someone was, was to be at one with them. Um, so that's uh, something that we don't, uh, we don't experience as much today, do we? Um, that being said, um, that's our scriptures for this uh, Sunday. Um, I'm preaching, and I don't know yet what I'm going to be preaching about, but um, stay tuned um, after this. Uh, if you're watching this on Sunday morning, um, you'll find out here in about a half an hour's time or 40, 40 minutes or so. Until next time, shalom.